Welcome back, everyone. Cube's coverage here in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm John Furrier with Rob Streche. Matt Hicks is here, president and CEO of Red Hat. Just hot off the keynote. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. So you mentioned three inflection points in your career, four inflection points. You set the table that moves you that you think we're in now. Mm -hmm. Take us through that again. You know, I um, when I go through my first moment was open source, just the impact of open source. In my days, that was compiling kernels on it. And then you move from open source to almost the internet, which was my dot-com experience of doing a website. And then distributed teams really sunk into me with Git and the how people could develop in parallel and merge. And then lastly, it was the iPhone with Edge. And those were really defining moments that sort of build the open hybrid cloud for us and how I experienced each one as we went through. And now with AI, we've been staying on the queue for you know over a year now, but now more heavily we're seeing AI hyped up, but actually having impact. Yep. And you mentioned ChatGPT kind of gives that ubiquity piece of it. And then really came out of the academia was the comment, where do you see AI going and impacting the developer? Because we were riffing at the open source summit around how open source is exploding into ecosystems. Yep. And there was a leaked memo from Google that talked about moats and how open source is growing into a much bigger impact. Yeah. How do you see AI growing and sustaining its impact? It, it's fascinating for me where I feel like I'm watching the open source innovation that I saw with Linux of how you saw it grow and people contributing and that impact and power with it seeing the exact same thing in AI. It was laid out in that timeline pretty well, but it's 100 times faster than I experienced with Linux. And so I think it will become the innovation model for, for AI. And as an open source guy, that's a really, it's an exciting thing that I think will impact development, operations, um, different core business models that we work with, but um, yeah, it'll impact all of them. So. When you look at the challenges that IT has, and we've been saying also security is a big part of that, how do the operations keep up with the speed of developers? Shift left, the security developers are handling that right in the pipelines. You have security threats. You Now you have AI, which is now a data opportunity yep. challenge as well. Seems to be those are the guardrails people talk most about in terms yeah. of scale. That's one of your core messages here, scale. How do you see those pick, that picture evolving? I think there are a couple of parts. On development and operations, we've spent a while where those sort of operated as two different entities with it, whether it's shift left or it's management by policy. I think those two functions have to team really well just to deal with normal development pace. Then when you get to AI, I think it has tremendous good potential. It'll also have challenges of people using it for security exploit. So you have to be able to apply it better and faster. I don't think it's an area to ignore. It'll be the same like development and operations teams. How do they use AI to apply in their domain um, really well? You know, one of the things that you guys did really well with the Ansible acquisition was you brought that in, mm -hmm. let it maintain its yep. great community. Yep. Um, but now with all this talk about AI and as, as cloud scale kicks in, mm -hmm. data's a big opportunity. Automation's the, on everyone's mind yeah. and that's an automation culture. Yeah. How, you, how does that kind of cross pollinate through Red Hat and IBM and, and your customers? Yeah, I think uh, one Ansible touches into that open source grassroots contributor model, which is, it's a phenomenal innovation model. So I think a lot of operations, they'll be the most under stress. How do they work faster and faster and faster as, as developers are using AI to augment their capabilities? You saw a taste of this with Ansible Lightspeed of how can we, we call it like, how do we raise the floor and the ceiling? So every, I could jump into Ansible and become proficient pretty fast in a lot of different areas. But then our Ansible experts also get a lot better because they can use Lightspeed, tweak it, don't have to write it. Explain this raising floor thing you just mentioned because we were talking before you came on, we came on camera about the impact of open source and I, we were, yeah. I was saying, there's gonna be a lot more developers coming in. Yeah. What yeah. does that raise the floor mean? Like in terms of like number of developers, what does that mean to you? I, I think uh, both number and how fast they're productive. I parallel this back to um, in my day when I started, you had to read books or in my case, read open source code to learn. But when 
Google came around and search was so ubiquitous, developers didn't have to do that same model. They could get a lot of suggestions. AI is doing the same thing. You can come out of college, have some core skills, and get really, really good in specialization yeah. fast, and then learn from the people around you at a quicker pace. So I think it'll add more, and then it'll speed up the progress and efficiency too. It's interesting, prompt engineering has been a term that came out of the ChatGPT movement, and then it was prompt tuning, yeah. and then <laughs> autonomous code. Yeah. I mean, prompting is just a parameter passing. Yeah. So that's a programming construct, that's going to continue in. Is that going to change how people level up? I mean, because what you're getting at is that the, the ability to learn is so fast, you could have a skill and be top of the heap really quick. Yeah, and this is a more subtle area, but I think you have the models of infinite parameters and train on all the things. And then you're seeing this specialized model application. Uh, language is what we all interact with with ChatGPT. But if you look at actually one of the IBM models, that's a code foundation model. It's almost the opposite of language. Language, you vary it all the time. With a code model, you want to ask it a thousand different ways and get the same <laughs> result every time. Otherwise, development becomes a bit chaotic. If everyone is changing how they do for loops every time they write code, it's going to have a tough outcome. So I think we'll see that specialization of models evolve as well, um, just for more domains. I think in terms of contributing back to open source, it's the thing that makes an open source model work on it. If you're not willing to contribute back, you're not going to build that critical mass of ecosystem. So everything we do is, we don't want to be the only ones running a project. We have to join, we have to contribute, but then that's where you tap into that innovation potential that you know, we see with projects like Backstage, we see with AI, we saw with Linux, we saw with Kubernetes. Um, but yeah, that's what makes open source work in our mind. You guys got a lot of news coming out. Can you just give the quick highlights that you mentioned on stage? What were your favorite ones? What's the key news that's kicking off the event? And I saw you leaking a little bit out there, but expand on what you see as the key news. Yeah, I, I would split it into two groups. There's one group of how do you manage everything in IT? I've worked in an IT role, it's incredibly tough. And so we have a balance of developer innovations like developer hub, service interconnect for hybrid, operator innovations, so Ansible Lightspeed, uh, event-driven Ansible. And then as you move those two teams faster, the security component is really key. And so we did supply chain work and some management work around uh, advanced cluster service. Uh, and then in parallel, we did the how do we move model development and deployment faster. But I think it's, if we lose sight of what people have to deal with every single day in IT, they're not gonna have enough time and cycles to work on the AI work. So we see that as really balanced. Uh, one of those gravitates to a lot of airtime on the AI side, but I think we have some really exciting work that people apply every day in their challenges today as well. You know, we talk about AI, and, and, and there's really two aspects. There's the AI app side, which you guys enable, top of the stack, and then below the infrastructure. Yep. Um, different perspectives. I think the, at the top of the stack is really more fast and loose developers, coding, <laughs> uh, experimenting, obviously DevOps, takes it to that level. Yep. But infrastructure, the concern is, I don't want hallucinations happening on my yeah. infrastructure. <laughs> so AI is going to be tighter, yep. uh, more controlled, and more secure. Take us through your thoughts on how infra the infrastructure AI looks versus, say, the app, um, app AI uh, embedded. Yeah, embedded. and I think this goes back to that, uh, Chris talked about this some, that specialization of models. For us, when you get into Ansible and you're automating infrastructure, you don't want a ton of variance on it. You have to, it has to be pretty deterministic. You want a lot of variance on inputs and prompts. You want really deterministic outcomes. And that, whether you call it uh, transformer models or generative AI or foundation models, the same unlabeled data training applies, but we apply it to a really, really tight domain. I think you'll see more of that on the infrastructure side where, uh, the large language models are incredibly demonstrable, but I don't think they'll apply equally to everything. So I think we'll see that split in models, and that's where we're yeah. investing is making sure we can accommodate all of it. I was talking to Rob last last event at Open Source Summit in Vancouver. 
I've read more academic papers in the past six months <laughs> than I have in the set six years. Yeah, I'm there's with more, you. There's more, uh, more stuff coming out. People are pumped up. I saw one about you know, contamination, about the test data. So yeah, yeah. Now, people have to be careful with AI yeah. and understand the, their IP rights, a yep. lot of concerns. Um, what's your advice to your teams? Because you want to innovate, yeah. but you also don't want to get <laughs> off the rails, so to speak. What do you, what's your advice to your team and your customers it with is, AI? I, I think that's a, it's a risk reward balance. How we deal with this is we, we work within open source. Open source is under the constraints of copyright choices and open source licenses. As cool as recommendations might be to a developer, you can't step afoul of either of those two lines. And this is the other reason we like uh, in our Ansible demo, we show attribution, we show where training is coming from, so you can make a more informed choice of whether you can safely include that in your code on it. And I think it's very powerful, but I think these topics, uh, we'll have to get through them before we see critical mass. Robert, it adds another dimension to software supply chain. If you think about attribution, yeah. Yeah. lineage, where's that code coming from? Speaking of software supply chain, what's your take on the current state of SBOMs and as this becomes more of an important conversation, uh, what's, your, what's your take on where we're at? I, I think it's exciting, we're biased. Like we've spent 30 years <laughs> curating open source supply chains so enterprises could use them. I think Log4j, the security issues, were a moment for a lot of companies to realize that they were using a lot of uncontrolled software that they didn't understand. So I think it's a great development of getting open source in more enterprise critical options and then knowing where it came from, knowing that it's supported. So it's exciting, it's moving fast, but I yeah. think it's an important area. So I think a big piece of it was really ha that attribution, where is it coming from, knowing it's, it's good code. Yeah. I think what will also be interesting and love your thought is when companies are also building out from their own repositories and how they can have, to your point, have focus on their own uh, IP as well. Yeah. No, I think there's a, I think there'll be a newfound interest in what's the difference between GPL, LGPL, ASL, MIT licenses, which is healthy because those are what make open source work and distributable. How you fit them into your model, right. it's an area we've always been passionate yeah. about because we can help uh, find those intersections yeah. that work well for you. But I think it's an area where you just can't, because open source is accessible, you can't take any of it and throw it yeah. into a proprietary software model and be okay with that. So that'll be the balancing act where we're excited. We think it'll drive a lot of open source adoption. But like the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, when there was a lot of focus on what these licenses mean, how do you include them well, I have a feeling we'll see a resurgence in and the importance of that in development processes. Now you guys, we've been big fans of Red House. You guys are successful, we love open source. We think open source wins, always wins. We don't bet against open source. <laughs> Putting all that aside for a second, AI wave, if it does come in the way we think it will be, we were speculating, how does open source as an organization survive? I mean, open source, I think the Linux Foundation is an example and other groups, they're all built from the bottom up, really thin top, not a lot of overhead. Yep. It's all keep the vendors out, make it, keep it open, keep it organic. When you have so much wave of people coming in and you have now ecosystems developing within yeah. the organizations, how does open source continue to grow and stay, I won't say relevant because it's relevant, but like stay stable, doesn't get toppled over by this wave? It's, I wish I could tell you like, well, I know the answer to this. <laughs> What's your um, opinion? But I have seen, if I go back through communities that have just grown to an incredible size and scale fast. Linux is one, Kubernetes has been another one. Kubernetes grew to that size a lot faster than Linux did. When I look at, at AI, whether it's open source aggregations a la Hugging Face, whether it's data repositories that are open and clean and no licenses, I think they'll just grow faster than Kubernetes. I don't think it'll be, it'll be organized differently than Linux work, than probably Kubernetes did. But I'm in the camp of I don't bet against open source. Like people will yeah, find a way to do it, and enterprises yeah. will find a way to pick channels that are stable that yeah. they can trust. And it's super exciting. I love yeah. it. It's yeah. plenty it's of challenges. But. It's an opportunity too. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean first of all, it's so solid. We we were speculating. We we put the question out there mainly to to, to discuss it, yeah. and we think it's going to continue to thrive. But it might look different. Yeah, it's going to have to because it's growing up. Yep, and it's different. 
open source was a lot of uh, code focus in the day. AI will be um, mathematics, codes, trained models, incremental models, data aspects, governance aspects. So it's just different components. But in Red Hat, we've always talked about uh, open unlocks the world's potential. And we don't say open source code. It's that model. And so for us, it's yeah. super exciting. Like this model will get applied to several other domains than just code. And I think it'll thrive. Final question for you. You're going to be very busy. I appreciate your coming on theCUBE. SiliconANGLE really appreciates your time, and I know you're super busy. No, appreciate what conversations me. are you going to be having this, this week with customers, your teams, your partners? What, I mean, obviously we know you're talking points, you just heard your keynote. What are the hallway conversations going to be like? What are you looking forward to? What are you going to be talking about? I, I look forward to the balancing aspect, which is as exciting as AI okay. is, and we've seen a lot of exciting technology trends you have to be able to free up your time and be more efficient to chase them. Uh, whatever chasing means to you, whatever application. Having the balance of announcements of we can make you faster with Ansible, uh, we can get you to edge faster. If you're moving into the cloud faster, we can accelerate you there. I love that because we know the part that you want to talk about and focus on. Uh, helping customers be able to unlock that is exciting. That'll probably be every hallway conversation <laughs> I have for the next uh, next. Awesome, you, you look super pumped. Thanks for coming on. Matt Hicks, President and CEO here on theCUBE. Go to siliconangle.com for the articles. I'm John Furrier with Rob Stretche, breaking down all the analysis. Paul Gillen is here as well. We'll be breaking down all the action, two days wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We'll be right back with our next guest.